Well, good morning, church. Thank you so much for joining us. We have a great Sunday, as we said, as we're closing out our series, Endless Vacation. I wanted to begin today by starting with a story. There's a story of a very busy businessman who was getting ready to go onto this next business trip that he had to take. And he was so anxious and worried, and he was afraid he was going to miss his flight. And he got all of his luggage ready. He gets into the car. He gets into the Uber. He goes to the airport. He pulls the luggage out, and he's walking up, and he sees someone on the other side of the desk where you bring your luggage, which is always a dangerous place to be, right? Your luggage may be a little too heavy, too light. And so he brings it over there, and he doesn't like how the employee behind the counter is just going at a calm, cool, collected pace. So he starts to raise his voice. He says, you don't understand how busy I am. You don't know what I'm about to go through. I need to get over here. I got to fly to New York, and then I got to come back, and, and I'm going to Toronto, and I need all this stuff to be taken care of. He says, sir, I'm going to help you out right now. Don't even worry about it. So he starts helping, and the man starts to get increasingly more impatient. He starts cursing at this gentleman. People all around stop and are nearly in shock because this man is yelling and cursing at the person on the other side of the desk. The employee is still standing there, calm, cool, and collected. Finally, the transaction ends. He grabs his plane ticket. He curses at the man. He gives him a salute that says he's number one, and he walks off. <laughs> There's an older woman that was standing next to there. She walked up to the employee and said, hey, how is it that you can hear people talk to you in such a rude way, and you just keep going on with your life so calm, cool, and collected? And he said this. He said, well, you know, being an employee at this airport for so long, I've realized that people eventually are going to regret what they do. She said, well, how do you know that? He said, well, you know, this man is headed to New York. I'm sending his luggage to Brazil. <laughs> so he definitely had a little bit of regret at that moment. This very busy businessman acted in such a way that there was going to be a moment when he was going to regret the actions that he took. And I don't know about you, but in my life, there's been moments where I've had regret. Regret is, this, is a similar emotion that many of us have, and we may not know exactly how to put words to it. And defined, it means deep sadness because of something we did or something we didn't do. And even though the definition seems a little elusive, I believe it's because we really don't know it until we experience it. And wait, there's this weight that comes with regret. We regret the things we did and stuff we didn't do. We regret the things we said and things we didn't say. We regret the little things, we regret the small things. Can I tell you one of my regrets from last week? DoorDash. Here's why. It was Sunday evening, and I wanted something sweet. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting something sweet, right? Well, here's the problem. I have all of the allergies, and one of them is gluten. But what I wanted was a Pop-Tart. Now, Pop-Tarts, if you're watching right now, we would love to see a gluten-free Pop-Tart option of the cinnamon <laughs> kind. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, but I really wanted a Pop-Tart. So, you know, the enemy created an app called DoorDash, so I pulled it out. And I said, hey, I, I want to see if I can get me a Pop-Tart. And you can. I ordered one sleeve of Pop-Tarts to the house. I sure did on DoorDash. Cost too much money. Don't do it. Don't do it. Uh, but I did. Uh, they drop it off, and I go out and get it. And, and Nikki, my wife, sees me, and she says, uh, what is that? And I was like, it's a Pop-Tart. She goes, doesn't that have gluten in it? I said, yeah, but, you know, it's, it's okay. She goes, you're going to regret that. And I was like, you're not a prophet, so don't tell me what's about to happen. So she said, you're going to regret that. So I, I decide to go ahead and follow through with my desire of eating this Pop-Tart. Let me tell you what happens when I eat gluten. I get a little fluffy, first off. I get a terrible headache. My back begins to hurt. My stomach is a mess. I'm up all night. I begin to sweat, and then I get too cold, and it's just awful. But man, the taste of that cinnamon, brown sugar, Pop-Tart, in the moment, sin was good, right? So I'm, I'm eating the Pop-Tart, and she looks over at me. You're really going to regret that. I said... I love you, but at this moment, this Pop-Tart is giving me what I need. And so I ate that Pop-Tart, and I got tremendously sick, and I had regret. Sometimes the small things, sometimes the big things. Maybe staying too long in that relationship, or getting out of the relationship too early, or giving up too early. Or maybe not going into that interview because you weren't sure what people were going to think. Maybe some of us are walking into this room with regret today of things that actually happened to us. You've been thinking, well, you know, when I was younger, my parents divorced, and it's my fault. Or someone you loved and trusted was supposed to be there for you, and they took advantage of you. Or someone that was so close to you hurt you in a way that you can't even put words to. I want to tell you today, it's not your fault. People are people, and they do a lot of people things. But it's not your fault. You were in a situation where someone took advantage of one of God's kids. God will always take care of that. 
That's not the regret we're talking about today. The regret we're talking about is the actions that we have done or the inaction that we've taken part of that has caused us to live outside of what God is calling us to do. In fact, regret, I think it can be summed up in two words, if only. Many of us say it, if only I would have done this, if only I would have done that, if only I could have gone there. If only. Here at this campus, we, we call that when you should on yourself. <laughs> yeah, give it a minute. I should have, I, I should, I wish, I should, and then I, I didn't, but I couldn't, and I, don't should on yourself. If only. What if there's a way when we, the truth is everyone does have regrets, regrets, but what if we didn't need to live in them? Today, I just, I just want to share the idea, what if regret doesn't have to be forever? What if the, the sins of yesterday, when you missed the mark, the things you did that you're not proud of, when you missed, when you missed out or you messed up, it, it, God, is there still something for me? I believe there is. In fact, all of us have these regrets. In fact, you look all throughout scripture, you see people time and time again doing something that they would intentionally regret afterwards. We talked about Moses a couple weeks ago. Moses was a murderer. Abraham was a cheater. Jacob was a deceiver. You start to go, go through, okay, David, he was an adulterer, also a murderer. Well, what about Peter? Okay, he was a denier. What about Paul, who, who was Saul before he came, became Paul? He was a murderer and a terrorizer. But God used every single one of those people because they didn't live in their regret. The regret caused them to do something, to bring some type of change so they could step into what God has for them. And that's the question we're asking today. How do I leave regret behind me to move on toward what God has in front of me? Wouldn't that be a beautiful day if we could take an endless vacation from regret, leave the luggage, and move forward to what God is calling us to? So I figured it would be a great time for us to look at someone who knows regret very well. His name is Paul, who originally was Saul. So if you have your Bibles, if you turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8 through 10, we're talking about Paul. His name was Saul. And then in Acts 9, he, he's getting ready to go and terrorize more Christians. He said, anyone that believed that Jesus was the Messiah is someone that needs to be imprisoned, they need to be isolated, or they need to be murdered. This, we're about to read this person's book. Right? This, is, this is someone who was so ready to get rid of people of the way, is which, which Christians were called back then, that followed the way of Jesus. You know, Saul grew up sitting under one of these great rabbis, Gamaliel, and so he would have heard all of the teaching. He would have understood uh, the Hebrew Bible, the law and the prophets. He would have gotten it all. He just knew a Messiah was coming, but he said, there's no way it can be Jesus. That doesn't look like Jesus. There's no way this can be the Messiah. So he wanted to end anyone's life who called Jesus the one of the way. Then it came to a moment in Acts 9 when his life is radically changed. God speaks to him, and he says, you know, I want to live a life that now exemplifies Christ. And so then he went a little overboard and he started to get a little harsh in his letters. I don't know if you've read much of the New Testament where Paul is writing. It is a gut puncher. He'll just be straight to it. Like, fix your life. You need to do more things. Be perfect. You're like, whoa, okay, hey, Paul, can we, do you remember who you used to be? But this is Paul. He starts doing this. And in fact, in one of the letters to the Corinthian church, he writes a letter that's a little harsh and he doesn't hear any response from it. So you, we all know what this feels like. This is like when you send a text message and then you see the three little dots pop up, and then they go away, and you're like, is everything okay? Are we good? Are we not good? I don't know. So this is kind of what's happening to him, and he's wondering. He's like, okay, I was probably too harsh in the letter, and people are going to be mad. People are probably going to stop following Jesus, and you know, the spiral and the ruminations just starts going and going, and I don't know what people are going to think, and then a man walks up to him named Titus. He's like, hey, Paul. He's like, yeah. He goes, that letter? Oh, I know. Hey, it went really well. What? It went well? No one told me. And so he got really excited. And so now he's like, well, I need to write the Corinthians another letter and tell them that, you know what? I have something for them. I'm excited for them because God wants to do something in them. So 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8, Paul says, even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurts you, but only for a little while. Okay. Uh, couples. Married couples, dating couples, highlight, circle, underline that verse and never say that to your spouse. Can you imagine? Hey, I, I, did, I don't regret it. I did for a little bit and it hurt you, but only for a little bit. You're fine, babe. <laughs> let's not do that, right? So let's leave it in the context. Remember, he wrote a harsh letter. and Okay, okay let's, verses in context make sense. Okay, and it goes on, verse nine. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. 
For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Notice, Paul is talking about this letter that I sent you. I needed to kind of share with you a different way of living. A way that, that showed that love is the precedent of all things. That, that Jesus is powerful. That he's here. That he's near you. And so you need to change the way that you are thinking about some things. I want your life to be changed forever. He says, so I understand now that that letter didn't hurt you. It actually equipped you. He goes on to verse 10. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. So if I want to get past this type of regret, like Paul did, I did regret it, but I don't anymore. What if there's a way when we can realize, just like Paul wrote, that there's something about sorrow that can help me move past regret? Again, when we do something that is not in line with what God has called in our lives, what we're talking about when you, missed, when you missed out, you messed up, and you feel you did something that you're not proud of, that maybe you wouldn't want to share with everyone. You know, if, if we put your thoughts up on the projector screens and the LED wall in this past week, I don't think many of us would be like, yeah, that was me. <laughs> yeah, all week, all perfect thoughts. <laughs> but, but what if we, we had this moment where we felt something, what Paul is saying, that moved us beyond regret. And this is why he writes in, in verse 10, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. There's this type of different sorrow and, and regret that we can fall into when we do something we're not proud of. I believe one of those stages is, is having no regret, no remorse, no sorrow at all. Right? That's none of us. We would never do that. But we're the type of people who say things like, well, you know what? I'm sorry I got caught. I'm not sorry for what I did, but I'm sorry about the consequences. Or we say like, I'm sorry that you're offended. I'm not sorry that I offended you. I'm not sorry that I did anything wrong. And then we justify our behavior and we refuse to change. You don't understand what I'm going through. The busy businessman. You don't understand this flight that I got to catch. You don't understand how many hours I worked this week. You don't understand that the load that work is just putting on me and I, I just can't, we just excuse ourselves from any of the action. Then it goes into this place of worldly sorrow that brings death. It's the one where you are sorry for what you did, but you're also sorry for who you are. So now I'm a mistake. I didn't make a mess, I am a mess. I didn't do something bad, I am a bad person. It just starts to cause you to replay that tape over and over again. You'll never be enough. You're not enough because you messed up. And God wants someone who's perfect. And that's not you. And the tape keeps playing and playing. And it brings death. But there's a better way. Godly sorrow. This godly sorrow says, I am sorry for what I've done, but I'm thankful for who God is. I've made mistakes, but I'm not identified by them. And in the face of every sin is an all-loving Savior. That's the type of sorrow that Paul is talking about. I may have messed up, but you know what? God took all of my mess, all of my shame, all of my guilt, and he put it on the cross so his son could carry it. And therefore, I am walking new and made new every single day. I'm walking free, and I am no longer in those shackles. That's the godly sorrow that Paul is talking about. Yeah, we're sorry for what we've done. We're not sorry for who we are, though. I'm thankful for who God is because he's changed our lives. And if you think, you know, we've done wrong things in our lives, all of us do have regret. If you think I've done something wrong and I've tried to have more godly sorrow, but I've messed up and I, I haven't even had the right type of sorrow, the right type of regret, you're not alone. We talked about God calling Moses and saying, hey, I want you to go lead the Israelites. I love this translation, the New Living Translation in Exodus. It says, Moses again pleaded, Lord, please send anyone else, anyone <laughs> Please, God, you, don't, you must not know what I've done, right? This is Moses who, who killed someone. This is Moses who was an Israelite who was living in the palace of the Pharaoh. This is Moses who would continually say, God, I, I'm not good at speaking. I'm not good at talking. You have to send someone else. You need other people to come with me. What am I going to tell Pharaoh? What am I? Please send anyone else. Because, because of his regrets, this sentence and the statement comes out of a place of insecurity and inadequacy. And I don't know about you, but I feel that in my life too often. God, just please send someone else. Because we can get stuck in this regret. And we say things like, if you only knew, 
the things that I have done. If you only knew what I've done in the past, you you would never expect me to have a future. But we can't stay there. And we know the rest of the story of Moses. He he eventually does lead the Israelites and get them out of uh, Pharaoh's land, gets them out of Egypt and getting right onto the brink of the promised land. And Joshua takes them into the promised land. If Moses stayed in this state right here, we would not even be talking about him today. In fact, he probably wouldn't even be in scripture. But he said, you know what? My past is not going to define me. There's a better future. We can't stay there. It's this idea that when I have godly sorrow, it moves past guilt and shame toward real life change. And we talk about this a lot because it's something that many of us experience. The difference between guilt and shame, guilt is based on actions. Shame is based on identity. What if we get past that and we're no longer what we did, we're who God calls us to be and our lives begin to change. You know, I've learned having this type of godly sorrow can change my life as well and I've gone through Each one of them, I have no regret at all. I've gone through worldly sorrow and getting into the place of godly sorrow, it takes work, but it is a beautiful place to be. One of the times that I think of for my own life where I have to work to get to this place to move towards real life change is one of my own addictions. And I bet you I'm not the only one in here with it. Everyone's like, what is he gonna say? (laughs) I prioritize work over relationships very often. In fact, I've done it most of my life. I started working when I was a very young age, and I really enjoy work. I love it. Sadly, I have prioritized that over other people. When both of my sisters were getting married to uh, their spouses, they, they asked if I would be willing to go to the wedding. One of them, I said I could because I wouldn't have to miss a Sunday. My other sister, I said I can't go because I'm going to have to miss a Sunday. I had friends that were having babies, and I just wouldn't go because I have to be at church. And God would tell me, hey, Marcus, you know you're not Jesus, right? Well, no, God, I got to be there and I got to make sure, you know, this place wouldn't run without me. You start telling yourself all these lies. Again, I know I'm not the only one. You can look at me crazy all you want. I know there's some of us in here. And I would say these things and act like everything was fine and I'm doing the Lord's work. Am I? Or am I building my own kingdom? Are we or are we building our own kingdom? And I know that when I fall into that, and it's something that I've gotten so much better at, and I call myself an, a recovering workaholic, and I've gotten so much better. But my wife at times will say these three words that remind me if I start to fall into that unhealthy lifestyle. And I never want to hear her say those words again. She says this, I miss you. And it hits like a ton of bricks when you know that She's not missing me because of distance, physical distance. She's, she's missing me because of relational distance, because I'm choosing to put work above her. You know, maybe your kids have said that, those things. I miss you, Dad. I miss you, Mom. And I know we're speaking in a room where many of us have served in the military, and I'm so thankful for that. You don't always have the choice to be at every single birthday. And I can only imagine what that is like. But my encouragement would be, when you are home, let's be present. Let's leave the computer at home. Let's make sure that we're not spending more time on our phone. Let's make sure we're not talking to our spouse or our kids going like this. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, sounds good, whatever. What if we're fully present? I talked about getting to this place of life change. A couple years back, my sister and her husband came to San Diego, and we got tacos because that's what you do in San Diego. We got tacos. These are the best tacos in the world. I feel like we just say that. I don't think, we're, I don't think we know. Uh, but we say the best tacos in the world. And so we had these tacos. We're, we're in downtown, and you're like, those aren't the best tacos. I know. But we're eating these tacos, and I look at my, my sister and my brother-in-law, and I say, I just want to tell you something. I said, yeah. I said, it was really unhealthy when you both got married. And I missed your wedding. I'm not asking you to forgive me. I'm asking for your forgiveness and take as long as you need to take. They put their tacos down, which is, which is heresy. <laughs> they put their tacos down, they grab my hand, they grab Nikki's hand, and they said, we love you, we're family, we're all growing. And it was at that moment I realized I lost years of my relationship with my sister and my friends and family members because I prioritized work over everything else. I need to fight that. 
And you say, God, I, I want my regret of placing work over everyone else, I want it to lead me beyond guilt and shame into this life change where I say, hey, you know what? I love you, church. I love my wife more. And I love my wife, but oh man, I love God. What if I can get to that place in my own life? And what is it for you? The thing that you still deal with, the thing that you, you still concentrate on and, and try to get over, but you feel like you can't even forgive yourself. What if God is saying the same three words that Nikki says to me? I miss you. I miss our talks. I miss our walks. I miss when you would read the word that I'm speaking to you. I want your life to be changed because I want it to be connected to me. This is what God is saying. I miss you. What if our life could be changed? And just like I sat on the other side of the table with uh, my sister and my brother-in-law and I said, would you forgive me? There's something about being repentant with God that totally leads us into this place that says, you know what? I, I can let go of this regret. I, I, can, I can let go of this regret because I, I know I've messed up, but I'm not a mess. I know I've done something wrong, but this is not where I have to stay. This is not who I have to be forever. This is, this is not who you are, there is more. I can choose repentance to get over this regret. Notice the same verse, 7, 10. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. And I know some of us, we heard the word repentance and you got chills down your spine. You started thinking of the person on the corner with the, the sign, turn or burn, and, and you better repent. And we think this word is such a terrible word, but church, it is beautiful. And I wish we understood what it truly meant. And so I want to share that with you. You see, this is a Greek word. The Greek word is metanoia. You're welcome. Look at that. Just say metanoia. Everyone? You're a theologian now. Look at you. Metanoia. The word means to change your mind. Meta means change. Noia means mind. The verb would be to change your thinking. This is why John the Baptist would say, repent. The kingdom of heaven is near. It's at hand. This is why Jesus would say, repent. The kingdom of heaven is near. It is at hand. It's saying, I want you to change the way you think about your relationship with God. Because for so long, they thought it was based on works. I had to do enough to experience Christ. He's saying, oh no, change your mind. Repent. <laughs> change the way you're thinking about this relationship. This relationship is a God who loves you enough to send his son to a cross to carry all of your sin, all of your shame, all of the guilt, and conquer it for you. So you don't have to work for the love of God. You get to experience it. That's what salvation is. Where your life is drastically changed and you are not only saved from, you are saved for the great purposes of God. There's no regret when salvation walks in. I'm not saying you will live a life that is free completely of regret. I will say when regret does come, if we are repentant and change the way that we think that God is going to love me less if, if I sin or God is going to love me more if I don't sin, if we change the way we think and we say God is present with me right now and he wants to love me and show himself to me and he's speaking those words, I miss you and I love you, it doesn't matter what bad we have done, we are saved. That's what it's about. He goes on, he says, worldly sorrow is going to bring this death, this death, though. I don't know if you want it. Right? You, you look at two of Jesus' followers, one of them, Judas, who betrayed Jesus, another one, Peter, who essentially betrayed Jesus. Judas betrayed Jesus, and it says in, in the Gospels that he immediately regretted it and felt remorse. He took his 30 shekels of silver, and he went to the officials, and he's like, hey, could you just take this back? And they're like, too late now, buddy. You sold Jesus to us, we have him. He stayed in the place of regret and remorse, and it cost him his life. Then you have Peter. He's watching Jesus be taken away. And I can imagine Peter saying, that's my Jesus, that they're taking, that they're arresting right now. That is my Jesus. I'm the one who's supposed to be protecting him. I tried to do everything I could. How could I let this happen? I would never deny him. And then someone walks up and says, hey, Peter, Aren't you a Jesus follower? No, that's not me. He denies. Happens three times. He denies. But there's a moment 
when Peter's eyes lock with Jesus, as you, it's recorded in the Gospels, the moment he says, no, I don't know who Jesus is, Jesus looks back at him, and I can imagine the pain of that feeling. Not only did I mess up, but I messed up in front of Jesus. What do I do now? But you see, Peter didn't stay there. Because Peter knew that I've seen people go to Jesus and, and share their deepest, darkest feelings, share those moments and, and ask God for forgiveness, and he has done it. Because the truth is repentance will bring us into a reconnection moment with God and restore every relationship. This is why when Mary and Martha go to the tomb where Jesus was supposed to be laying, the stone is rolled away, there's a big angel, and the angel says, do not be afraid because angels are really big, and I would be afraid every single time. I'd be like, well, be smaller then, and I wouldn't be as afraid. And they say, don't be afraid. I want you to tell the disciples, including Peter, that Jesus has gone ahead of them. He wants to meet with them. Those two words, including Peter, including Marcus, including Steve, including Mike, including Maddox, including Jaden, this, bring everyone, including the ones who feel like they're too far gone, let them know that Jesus is waiting for them. So Peter goes. Could have stayed in the regret and just, no, God, I'm, I'm too unholy to be near you. He could have stayed. But he goes to meet with Jesus. They're on the beach. They're having fish for breakfast, which never done it. I don't know if I will. Uh, and they're just having a good time. And Jesus asks these questions. He says, do you love me? To Peter. He says, of course I love you. One time, two times, three times. The same amount of times that Peter denied Jesus. And then Jesus says the two words that he spoke to Peter. If you love me, then follow me. When we repent and we reconnect with God in this way, he says, I know you messed up. Do you love me? Yeah, Jesus, I, I do. Sometimes I just make the wrong decisions. Okay. Do you want to be forgiven? Yeah. God, please forgive me and take this away from me. Help me. Okay, then follow me. Then live out your calling. Stop living in regret and live out your calling. Go to the next place that God is leading you. And, and Paul would go on in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 11 is one of my favorite verses in the message paraphrase. paraphrase says, and now isn't it wonderful all the ways which this distress, this regret, this guilt, this shame has brought you closer to God. And this is what we look like. He says, you're more alive, you're more concerned, more sensitive, more reverent, more human, more passionate, more responsible. Looked at from every angle, you've come out of this with purity of heart. When I stand before God and say, I've, I've messed up, will you forgive me? He says, of course, you love me, yeah. Okay, follow me. He says, Marcus, you're more alive. You know what, out of everything you possibly could be, you've walked out of this with purity of heart. Even when you made every wrong mistake, even when you did things that you, you, you feel like, I'm so horrible as a person, God says, no, you're, you're loved. You're more concerned, more reverent, more sensitive, more human, more responsible. I don't know about you, I could use some more responsibility in my life. More responsible when, when I come with repentance, it gives you the hope. And we get to, play, to the place where we get to leave regret fully in the past and focus on God's hope for our future. I know many of us have done things that we extremely regret. And so right now, if you would just tell the person next to you your deepest, darkest regrets. No, I'm just kidding. You would, wouldn't do that. <laughs> but if I, if I leave that regret in the past and focus on what God has for me, imagine what could happen in your life. It reminds me of a story of an April morning in 1888. A man named Alfred woke up as he normally does, put his feet on the ground, went and grabbed the newspaper. In front cover of the newspaper, to his surprise, he found out that he died. He was reading his own obituary. Now, obviously, there was a mix-up. So the mix-up was Alfred had a brother named Ludwig, and Ludwig had passed away. I mean, this is 1888, so he didn't just, you know, text someone. So he reads, and he says, okay, I have the option right here to see my legacy in print, or do I just ignore it? He said, I want to read it. And as he started reading, he realized that people were celebrating his death. 
We're glad he's died. They called him the merchant of death because he helped invent dynamite and other explosives. And he says, you are profiting off people's suffering. And as the article continued to go on, people just talked about how greedy he was, how selfish he was, and that he was someone who was no benefit to mankind. And so Alfred said, from this day forward, my life will never be the same because I don't want this to be my legacy. So Alfred, that day, truly began to change his life. He started doing more philanthropy and and, and helping people around him. He changed his attitude. He smiled more, which all of us could do more of. And six years later, he truly did pass away. And his family read his obituary. And they weren't celebrating his death. They were celebrating his life. He said, this is someone who did more good for the world to benefit mankind than anyone else we know. Someone who truly loved people, someone who truly surrendered people, someone who was truly selfless. If you don't know Alfred's story, there's a reason why, because in his will, he said, I want to put 94% of all of my earnings in my entire life to start a foundation that would give awards to people who do phenomenal things that better humankind and humanity. His name was Alfred Nobel. And because of him, the Nobel Prize exists. Because he saw his legacy in print and said, that's not what I want to be. What about you and me? If we saw our legacy in print today, is that who we would want to be? Right now, if if this is it, man, there's a better life to live. As I said, you look at Moses, where he started, God sent anyone else. Deuteronomy, the the fourth book of of the Bible, says that there was never been another prophet in Israel like Moses whom the Lord knew face to face. Wait, Moses, the one who was like, no, God, I can't? Yes, him. The one who murdered someone? Yes. The one who like did some bad? Yeah, that's him. There's never been another prophet in Israel like Moses who the Lord knew face to face. And I bolded the first part on purpose. There has never been another you whom the Lord wants to know face to face. He wants to know you face to face. There is no mess that is too big. There is no wrong that is too wrong. There is no sin that is too great. He says, I want to know you face to face. And he may be speaking those words, I miss you. You may be thinking, God doesn't even know me. (laughs) He does. And there's never been another you, and he wants to have a relationship with you. Later on in, in Hebrews, Hebrews 11, we call it not the hall of fame, but the hall of faith. Moses was in the hall of faith because he did so many amazing things. And, and the author says, and he kept going by keeping his eyes focused and fixed on God. Not regret, but focused on God. That's God's heart for you and I as well. That we would live a life that is so focused on God, not a regret, that our lives would be changed. He would say, I want to know you face to face. There's never been another like you. And once we get to that place, we can start saying these proclamations that we wrote down for for this weekend, that my regrets are not too big for God's grace. This is why it's good to always continue to read scripture and find out the depths of the grace of God that are available for us. There's no sin too great for the grace of God. I'm not what I've done. I am who God says I am. We sing that song, are you hurting or broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. He's calling you by name. He's saying, son, daughter, come to me. And then last, we may not be able to change our past, but Jesus can change our future. This is about the hope that we get to have in him. This is what we get to declare. I want to say them out loud together. So I want to truly believe it. We'll start with the first line. My regrets are not too big for God's grace. Let's say this. My regrets are not too big for God's grace. Let's read the next line. I am not what I have done. I am who God says I am. Let's say the last line. I cannot change my past, but Jesus can change my future. If that is true, then today, what regrets do I need to leave behind? What do I need to let go of? What do I need to ask God to forgive me of and be healed of? 
What are the things that I'm holding on to? Maybe, maybe your regret happens nearly every day or a few times a week because there's addictions that you just feel like you can't let go of. We want to help you. Whether it's groups, meeting with our pastoral team, praying with you, giving you resources, we want to help you. I share this with, with all of our men's groups. Um, for, for anyone dealing with any type of addiction, there are some great apps that you can have on your phone and all of your devices. And for me, I have one called Covenant Eyes. It's out of Job. I made a covenant with my eyes that I might not sin against God. And when I worked at Chick-fil-A, we would say this, just keeps honest people honest. And you can think that a pastor to stand before you to, to say that there is a protection on all of my devices means that I'm weak. I think, I think that it means that I've learned from the wisdom of others. And so everything that I look at on my phone, I get random screenshots taken from my phone and they're sent to my accountability partners. So guess what? I'm not going there. I'm gonna keep my eyes focused on God. Because I don't wanna have a phone call that says, hey, hey, Pastor Marcus. Uh... <laughs> but you know what? There were addictions that used to be living in my life and I had to leave them behind. Now I'm, remember, I'm reminded of after Hebrews 11, the hall of faith, I'm reminded of what they say about Jesus. The author says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that easily entangles. Watch this next part. It's one of my favorite passages in scripture. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him. This is the joy of the Lord right here. He endured the cross. It seems like there's some type of typo. The, the scribe didn't write it correctly. No, the joy that was set before Jesus is you. And he endured the cross, scorning all of its shame, all of the guilt, all of the regret, everything that you have gone through so that you could be received by him. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Do you know what the number one complaint about Jesus was while he was on earth? Many of us think it's a blasphemy. Not quite. It was that he received sinners and ate with them. Time and time again, you see it. Religious people and non-religious people getting frustrated because Jesus is sitting with sinners. Yeah. He receives us. People with regret. People that have made the wrong decisions. And he welcomes us in. When you came in, you should have received the communion cup and the bread. If you didn't, we have our servers in the back. If you just lift your hand, we're going to take it in a moment near the end of the service. But this is what it's about. Before we even do that, I think, I think there's an opportunity for us, for those of us who need to say yes to Jesus. Maybe we've been dealing with so much regret that we think that God couldn't love us enough. Again, the things I've done are not too big for God's grace. I'm not what I've done. I'm who God says I am. I may not change my future, but I know Jesus can change, or my past, I know Jesus can change my future. This is available for us. So if you're in the room today, I just want to pray for you. If you would just close your eyes just for a moment. And you're saying, you know what? I've lived with so much regret that I didn't think that Jesus could even love me. I want to give an opportunity now before we even take communion to experience what God has for us, this love that he has for you. So maybe it's your first time saying yes to God. Maybe you're just saying, you know what? I've lived in the regrets and I've been missing the mark and falling into sin too much. God, I want to make a declaration today that says I'm getting the help where I need it. I'm going to move forward where I need to and I'm going to fix my eyes on you. If that's you, would you just lift your hand? We just want to pray with you. I see your hands. See your hands. See your hands. Online, you can even put it in the chat. Just say yes. I see your hands. I see your hands. I see you. This is the moment. Remember, the joy set before Jesus was going to the cross for you. He had your name in mind. And he said, all the shame and the guilt is gone. So let us pray together. 
Let's pray as a family. Would you repeat after me? Jesus, I have regret. There's things I've done that I'm not proud of. But God, you have done the one thing that I needed. Sending your son to give his life so I could have one. So forgive me. Heal me. And remind me of the hope I have that is only found in you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Give a hand for God for those of us that have guessed to Jesus this morning.